Welcome to College Football Roundtable, your source for college football coverage, including major storylines, playoffs, can't miss game previews, and picks each week. Join your hosts, Dan, Rob, and Jordan at the roundtable for a show unlike anything else. As for Football presents the College Football Roundtable. It's all over but the crime. College football committee has made their choices, and Florida State and Georgia are on the outside looking in. The committee said that the SEC champion would make the playoff, and that seems to be the only thing that they mentioned during the week that held true. What's up, Trash Talkers? Welcome back to the College Football Roundtable or Ring Knocker Radio. Uh, you've got me, Rob, your host in Fayetteville, North Carolina. i got Dano Ikebesa calling out of Coastal Connecticut, and Trigger Joe is in school, I'm assuming. Or dealing with some family stuff. Either way, uh, Joe, we'll keep your we'll keep the light on for you. So if you pop in, we'll definitely uh, add him into the flow of the show. But so uh, yeah, championship weekend was exactly that. I think it was a pretty high speed uh, occasion. Uh, watched the games on Friday night. The Friday night games I think were a little bit better than some of the games on Saturday because they were a lot closer until the waning moment. So you know the Pac-12 championship went down until the better end. And uh, New Mexico State proved me to be wrong because those guys are a much tougher team than they appeared to be uh, yeah. during the course of the season and, and gave Liberty a pretty hard time. But uh, If you like the running game, man, Friday was the night for you. That that Conference USA Championship game, they were running the hell out of the football, both teams. Yeah, yeah they, they, they really didn't run. Uh, then, of course, on Saturday, I watched Texas dismantle Oklahoma State and then Bama beat Georgia, which <laughs> – like, I didn't think it would be that much upheaval, but it happened. And then uh, I watched the first half of the Michigan game. I kind of turned it off after, you know, the quarterback was throwing a pass and the pass got, was it bad at pass or was it a fumble? I'm not really sure. And then they gave it to Michigan and I was like, okay, they're going to win. You know, everything is kind of going their way. Plus they were executing pretty well. So uh, I switched over and watched the rest of the UFC fight night on Friday night. Dano, how about, uh, what'd you end up watching? Yeah, so I, I did the same. I had the the split screen thing on Friday, and I really thought New Mexico State was going to pull it out. I was pulling for them pretty hard. I never doubted Washington for a second. Like I just thought they had it the whole way. Um, Saturday's games, I didn't think were all that entertaining outside the SEC championship, which was an instant classic. I mean, yeah. you know, and I, I even said this on Twitter, like Georgia's having trouble dealing with first half Alabama, and the problem is second half Alabama is actually the best team in the country. So... Yeah. Um, when they when they went in with a lead at halftime, I thought you know I, I feel like I knew how the game was going to end. And uh, again, you know, if you're Georgia and you got Brock Bowers on on your team, why are you not throwing to him more? Like he's he's a good player. Uh, yeah, Texas. I, I mean, in most of the games were blowouts. Even the yeah. ACC championship game where neither offense could really do anything wasn't like a game, you know, Louisville, yeah. they looked like they never looked like they were in it, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I, I think it was just a lack of production on Florida state's part. And that was because, yeah. you know, Jordan Travis isn't there. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it pays out. So uh, we'll dive into the commercial first and then we'll talk about the, the rest of uh, the college football season. All right. So if you like ask for football and you want to support our coverage of army sports and the American football conference, we could use your help through Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash ask for football to learn more. We also have links on our website at the yearling level. You get weekly games and locks at the cow level. You get that plus our scouting report at the firsty level. You get access to the exclusive firsty club, which is our private first Facebook group for our top level patrons. And this is the best place to talk Army sports in general, because we're all super fans, we try hard to keep it positive, and it's a private group, so whatever happens there stays there. Uh, firsties also get access to the live show recordings, which so you can interact with us during the show. And uh, the reality of it is, is we've spent a lot of money in the last year to improve the show. We're now in StreamYard. We're using Podcastle AI to improve sound quality. And uh, we've got regular recording time so people can join us live. And all that stuff takes time and money, time and, money and that's why we need your support. Now, back to the college football. So... When you dive deeper into the numbers, like it's astonishing that Michigan is number one 
in the college football rankings. And the reason why I say that is because they had number 47th overall strength of schedule. So they have the weakest strength of schedule mm. of everyone other than FSU. And the same argument that you could make that put FSU out of the title picture is the same reason why Michigan should not be ranked number one. They didn't have very many quality top 25 opponents. You had Penn State and Ohio State, which was the last week of the season, basically. And then, <clears throat> you know, their other ranked matchup that they won was against Iowa in the Big Ten Championship. And so I knew that, like, I knew that there was going to be an SEC team in the top four. I was assuming that it would be Georgia. I figured Georgia would have fell from one to four because they're the reigning national championships. You got, you know, national champions, you got to give them a shot, you know. But I think two things happen that kind of locked it up for the committee. And that was the fact that Texas beat the brakes off Oklahoma State. And then Bama is just a way better team in the second half. And what was what was the skepticism with Florida State became true against Louisville. Like if Florida State would have trounced Louisville like 36 to 3, then they would be in the playoff. But because it was such a close game, nobody even gave them a consideration. And then of course Georgia Georgia had the number 43 strength of schedule. So when you look at the teams that made it into the playoff, Michigan had number 47 strength of schedule. Washington was like top third of college football. They were at 32. Texas had 17 strength of schedule. Bama had the number three strength of schedule in the country. So when you look at strength of schedule, I think that genuinely was the honest reason why the committee made the choices that they did. However, I just hate all the, the you know, the smoke and mirrors language. Like, just, just say that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, hey, look. I put something out on the socials today and I was just like, bottom line is fan bases and storylines make for the most interesting games. And that's what the committee is looking at. To be honest, man, I, what are your thoughts? It, yeah. I, you know, I do hate it for Florida state fans, but they got the best four teams. I mean, at the end of the day, you can only take the top four conference champions. That's all we've ever wanted. Well, there were five power five conference champions, which means you had to pick whichever one you thought was the weakest one. And, you know, did they get uh, penalized because of their quarterback's injury? Obviously they did. Um, it is what it is. And, I, you know, all this wailing and gnashing of teeth, I don't know what universe people thought. And, uh, you know, a one-loss Alabama SEC champion was going to get left out of the playoff. It was never, never going to happen. It was not on the board. It was not a thing that was going to occur in America. It was a better yeah. chance of Michigan getting left out than Bama, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, and, and the other part of it is, the bottom the bottom line is the the uh the discussion <laughs> was said earlier in the week right the, the discussion was said earlier in the week SEC championship the SEC champion is going into the playoff that was that was one of the only things that was spoken that was actually true that came out of all the committee talk leading up to that and then of course for those of you guys that are watching this we'll flash this up but like you know they we picked the four we, teams there's a, there's more- a now, there's a naughty word so if you're offended just don't look at that word yeah But the bottom line is that's absolutely right. Again, storylines and fan bases matter, right? So I know for a fact that Washington's going to travel this year because their team, this might be their only chance to win the national championship in the current, in the play, in the current playoff, right? You know, you know, Bama's going to travel, you know, Michigan's going to travel and doggone it. Texas is the biggest state in the union. So guess what? Their fans are everywhere. Like, you know, everything's bigger in Texas, and so is the fan base, right? <laughs> so that's, that's essentially what it's going to boil down to. And, and you know, if you're an FSU fan, sorry, I think you got boned. But the reality of it is, is like, if FSU would have made their case like Texas did, then they probably would be in the playoff. Like, I, Who would I they have dropped out? If, if Honestly, FSU had beat the brakes off of Louisville, who would they have dropped out? Would they have had probably, a – go ahead. My my gut tells me like like if they would have if they would have bulldozed them like sixty something to, to twenty or something like that like if they had won by thirty points yeah. I think Washington would be number five mm. and they would be in. Wow! Because Can you imagine people would go crazy. But uh, but again, when it comes to storylines, it's the last season of the Pac-12, so they're not going to have a Pac-12 representative in the playoff because they're mm. eligible. You know what mm. I mean? It's like hey, look, yeah, yeah we could pull those guys out. And again, they're like, there's going to be people that are going to complain. They're going to be people that complain about Bama, right? But guess what? I mean, what? if they left Bama off, you know, it would have been good Lord. Well, <laughs> well but, but, but the thing is, like, when you look at quality wins and losses, like, Texas made their case by yeah. blowing out Oklahoma State and then, like, hey, we beat Bama and then we crushed our opponent. And so that makes Bama look better rather than worse. 
And so yeah. when you look at it from the quote eye test, which I hate that term because like the reality of it is, is these guys don't watch enough football to actually have an eye test. And these guys are professional analysts and they still don't watch enough football to, to get down to it. The fans, you know, I mean, it, it was bad. And then of course there's all kinds of conspiracy theories and speculation because like I saw a post today with uh, Kirk Herb street and they're like Herb street knew because like he had the helmets in the exact order behind him. And you're like, all right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, like put your ten, put put your tinfoil hat on and have another shot, man. Like, eh, I'm over it. The you thing know? that sucks is that you'll have two teams with no D playing for the spot in the national championship, and then Michigan and Bama will have a slugfest to get in. Yeah, uh, 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 Washington, I think, has played some really good football, and uh, I think yeah. Texas has been good too. But if if you put Texas and Bama back on the field together again. Like, just because Texas won that the first time, like, Alabama's a very different team than they were at the beginning of the season. Yeah. That's, you know, teams change over the course of time. Like, that's that's the Army team. You know, Army started really slow, but they won three in a, three in a row, beat three good teams. You know, like, teams evolve. This is the reality, so. Yeah, I mean, we, and we talked about that on the other show, too, right? Like, we yeah. talked about on the Army show is, like, look, there's two, to- there's two times that you make adjustments during the college football season, right? At halftime and in the middle of the season. And those are the adjustments that chart cause you to win, you know? And so if you look at what Bama has done and like, Hey, look, you can, you can be mad at Saban if you want to, but like that guy is, he's a staple of college football. And so if I have, you know, if I have an opportunity to put, you know, our generation's bear Bryant in the national championship, they're going to do it. Yeah, It's not complicated. You know, they're going to do it. That's what it boils down to. So New Year's Six Bowls, man, those are going to be crazy. So <laughs> the Fiesta Bowl, you've got Oregon and Liberty. That's going to be an interesting – because that will be a definite contrast of styles. Oregon's going to beat the brakes off of Liberty. Absolutely. Oregon's, Oregon is a good team. I mean, listen, Liberty has a good running game, but I just don't yeah. think that's going to be enough. Yeah, well, the only the only, the only only issue that we have now is Bo Nix has now said that he's played his last college football game, so he's opting out of the bowl. So more oh, than might, likely – That he, might make it spicy. He might not be the starter, so that will make that game a little bit more interesting. So, like, if you give, you know, a guy that hasn't played much at, you know, at Oregon the start against the team that can control the ball, like, it could make it a little bit more interesting contest. You got mm-hmm. Florida State and Georgia, oof. Like, <laughs> all depends on all depends on who plays in on Georgia, mm-hmm. right? Because, like, if a lot of their guys sit, which, you know, Vlad McConkey and Brock Bowers – take a day off that could be the difference in winning and losing that ball game i i think my opinion i, I can't imagine bowers would i mean the guy was hurt he came back for one game you know probably wasn't himself based on how they used him yeah and and i think that well and that's something i want to i would talk about a little bit later but like we're at this point i think the biggest mistake that georgia made playing against alabama was not pulling mcconkey and brock bowers when they were hurt like both of those guys were hurt they were playing at 60 or 70%. Mm. Put some young guys in. You know All what right. I mean? All right. Well, I have a different take. Their biggest right. mistake by far was double spying Jalen Milrow. Is uh, there's times when you when you want that guy to run when, you know, a, a 10-yard scamper is going to hurt you way less than whatever yeah. he's doing in the pocket. Yeah. And they totally lost that. And yeah, when I, he's throwing, throwing those wheel routes and they got nobody to cover him because they got two guys spying the quarterback, come on, man. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think that was part of it too. The defensive scheme didn't help them either. But like no. offensively, if they would have if they would have put some of the younger guys in, because you had a young guy make a huge catch that yeah that yeah really got, that guy was great. And yeah. they're like, where's that dude again? Like y'all need to use him because like McConkey is hurt. But uh, rolling down after that, you've got Penn State and Ole Miss. That should be an awesome. That's a game good game, yeah. Because I, I think that one will be good. It's a Peach Bowl, so that's essentially a home game for Ole Miss because I think their fans will travel better than Penn State. And then, of course, you've got the Cotton Bowl with Ohio State and Missouri. And that'll be interesting, too, because uh, Kyle McCord said he's entering the transfer portal. He announced that today. So McCord is leaving, and that clears the way. And I'm, I'm saying this as a joke, but uh, like I That's saw some, art- some article popped up and said Arch Manning is coming to Ohio State because he's been chatting it up with uh, Quinn Ewers and talking about the culture and the opportunity and blah, 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 blah. And honestly – like this is no ding on anybody, but it, like Ryan Day has had the ability to recruit and get quarterbacks into the NFL. So when you look at the slate of quarterbacks that he's coached at Ohio State, Ohio State is quarterback you, whether you agree with it or not, you know, whether they beat Michigan or not, like 
Ryan Day has seven quarterbacks that he recruited that made it into the NFL. So if you're a quarterback, it kind of makes sense. Mm. I don't know how those guys are all doing. Any of them have a winning record right now in the NFL? Well, no, because they get drafted by the crappiest team because the way the NFL draft works. But, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, Joe Burrow, but now he's hurt. But you think about. Yeah. Burrow, all right. All right. Recruited, all right. You know, yeah. 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 I'll give you, you Burrow. Know, you know, and freaking the AFC rookie of the year, man. Freaking CJ Stroud is destroying people at the Texas. Is he? All yes. Right. I haven't watched very much uh, NFL. Okay. I, I, uh, yeah. Well, and the only reason why, and the only reason, and the only reason why I know that is because, like, every time they talk about, every time you see anything about Stroud, that dude is, you know, that yeah. guy's he's on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. No, I, I, I forgot. You're right. CJ Stroud's having a good, good year. Uh, somebody says uh, one of our comments: when the music stops, the players have to pick a school. Anyone without with left without a school has to go pro. The weirdest thing about it is, like, if you can make it to the NFL and get. A, a payday, then that's great. But you know, if you're like Frank Harris, and you're probably not going to make that NFL roster, like the XFL is a poor second choice to even NIL money at, at even a place like UTSA, which is nuts. That's nuts. So, yeah. Well, and and things that the the XFL and the USFL should get better because they're merging those two leagues and yeah. dropping a couple of teams. And so yeah. maybe maybe you know the combined you know, add revenue of having the rock as the freaking owner of one of the leagues or part owner of the league. Maybe that will help, but even still, you're not getting to the level of the NFL. Yeah. Well, that's fine. It, it, it's fine. Um, I have enjoyed when at the play at a relatively high level, like a couple years ago when the XFL guys realized that they couldn't run the NFL offenses and they were running like the read option. I've enjoyed that a lot. It, it annoys me when they get f- you know, real stubborn about it. And they're like, no, we're going to do pocket passing. Like you do not have those players. Those are not the players on your roster, but anyway. Yeah, that's fair. All right. Dan, uh, it, to you. Oh yeah. Um, it, like, like you said, I think it sucks for Florida state, but uh, like I said, I, I do think the committee chose the best four teams. Um, I, I'm not sure the ACC had a realistic path to the playoff within their control. If like other things happened, I sort of think we saw that, but um Anyway, I guess we'll see. All right, so uh, it is now time for us to do our interview because we got a little time this week. We only one game this weekend, obviously, and that's the Army Navy game. We're going to talk about that a ton over on the other show. So this week's interview is with our very own Rob Robinson. It, it's funny because we brought Rob over here, um, you know, to help us do all this um, editing the podcast and just all this technical stuff. And now he owns this podcast. Like this is Rob's show. He does everything with it. And like we absolutely could not run as for football without Rob, but we never get a chance to like interview you or, or introduce you to the to the people. Like all they know is that that you know you in infantry graduated class in nineteen ninety seven. So I feel like by now you know the drill. Uh, but why don't you why don't you give us your little spiel here? All right. So here's here's the rundown. So uh, <laughs> graduated from you know. I'll start off with, I was, I was an army brat. So my, my father retired after 27 years as a sergeant major in the army. So he was a grunt and uh, that kind of set the wheel in motion, but graduated from West Point class of 97. I was a systems engineering guy. Uh, companies were C4 go Cowboys. I know everybody hates that because that was like the loud and most annoying company in the core probably still is to this day because of the stupid motto that they have to do every day at Chow Hall. Um, was F- graduated out of F1. That's where I scrambled to. So I was a Friars. I think it's a firehouse now because I, they change all the names every, you know, every quarter century. Yeah, they put a new name in the, in the core, it, whatever it is. But that that's really uh, C4 and F1. Uh, sports, I played sprint football all four years. I was a three-year letterman uh, in sprint football and uh, coached the company boxing team as a cow in the first day. So that was kind of my West Point experience uh, athletically. Why West Point? So – one day in junior high, I knew that like that was just what I was gonna do. Like I'm gonna join. Wow, you just yeah. you just twelve. You just woke up and like that's. Yep. Uh, I was like, okay, yeah. It was like yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna join the army and yeah. and uh, and I'm gonna be an airborne ranger. Like those were the only two things I knew. I didn't know if I was gonna be an engineer, or infantry guy, or field artillery. <laughs> I was just like airborne ranger. That's it because like that was what I grew up around. And so when I got into high school, my ROTC instructor, ironically, was. Uh, my dad's first sergeant when he worked in 375. 
and okay. in the ranger department. And so he was my instructor in high school. And between the two of them, they were like, Hey, look, you can always join the army, but the yeah. opportunity is there for you to go to college. So you should think about considering going to West Point. And so I did took the plunge, uh, did all the paperwork, did all the, the battle drills and everything else. And then Holy crap, like it actually happened. So I got picked up to go to West Point, of course. And when I got there, there were two guys from my high school already there. So we had the Austin brothers, Jody and Evan were there. Uh, one was a 95 guy. One was a 96 guy. We had three from my high school make it in at the same time. So if you guys That's know wild. Uh, yeah. So what? if you know, Rob, Rob Cordray or Mike Kelly, those two were my classmates. We were in ROTC in high school together. And then we all went to West Point together. That's amazing. I mean, just because of the way that the selection works, where was this? What part of the country? Which high school? This is a, uh, Western PA. So okay. we were in Butler High School. Yeah. So Dude, that's, that, that could never happen today, I don't think. It just, because yeah, uh, friends I know who are on the field force, it's like trying to mix and match all the freaking districts and it's nuts. Yeah. It, and it, it just, it worked out in our favor. So we went with three. And then we had two other guys come in behind me. One guy was in ROTC. With, well, both of these guys were in ROTC with me. My ROTC program was really good. You know. Yeah, I see that. And, <laughs> and, and and you don't realize it until like, holy crap, man, we have like five guys from our high school that made it into West Point. That's pretty impressive. And so that's that's ended up happening. But, uh, you know, typical cadet experience, decided that I was going to uh, branch infantry. You know, and the reason why I did it was because like combat arms was a family tradition. My grandfather was a sapper in World War II. My dad was an infantryman. So like that was all I grew up around. You know, I lived at Fort Benning. We spent so much time at Fort Benning. My dad was in every unit at Fort Benning, except for a third of the third in the drill sergeant school. So, you know, like Fort Benning was life. Like I remember going to the, you know, the 34 foot tower at like eight, nine, 10 years old and jumping out of that thing. So it like started a long That's time awesome. ago. So I, yeah. yeah. So grew up around it, thought it was cool. And, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to join the army and then I did. So then, then came commissioning, right? So branch night, that's always cool. Post night, not so much when you're like in the lower third. Of the class. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> So, you know, by no means was I an academic giant at school. I did better my junior and senior year than I did my freshman and sophomore year, but, uh, got stationed at Fort Polk. And, you know, the reason why I went to Fort Polk, because I knew it was a jump assignment. I was like, hey, I already went to airborne school, want to go to an airborne assignment. No way in hell that Rob's getting Vincenza or the 82nd. So Fort huh. Polk was like the last jump slot on the freaking table. So I went to oh, Fort Polk. Oh, man. Yeah, I was. Did they cheer there. when you took that voluntarily? Uh, believe it or not, we had one guy in our class that was like, he was like number two or number three academically. And the dude took NTC. And so it left the Italy slot on the table and everybody was like, what is he doing? Like this guy's going to NTC. Like who wants to do that? And so like the number three or number four guy right behind him got to go to Italy because oh, man. it was still available. It was like, that was like the craziest thing during post night. But, uh, you know, platoon leader and company XO at first battalion, five nine thousand B co Terry Brandon was an echo. He was XO. And then he was our S one. So I met Terry literally in 98, 99, something like that. So, you, you know, Terry's one of my best friends, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm oh, saying. Yeah. So we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like okay. I've known him, like I've known him for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, I think, he was, I think he ended up being our S1 before he left, but uh, did my time there. Uh, opted to go to the advanced course early. Like literally what happened is I switched dates with uh, one of my sister platoon leaders. Cause he was trying to go to jump master school and he needed a couple extra jumps. So yeah. I was like, all right, man, I'll switch with you. And I went to Fort Benning early and it worked out in my favor because I was able to take company command early. So what they were doing at the time, because there was a shortage of infantry captains is they would put you in an 11 month command on Sand Hill. You wouldn't get BQ'd. You'd go to the advanced course and then you would get a KD job of choice after. the. OK, course. so at least one person listening to this doesn't know what all those acronyms are. All right. Sorry. So. Key and developmental job, right? So okay. a, after getting that key and developmental job at, uh, you know, at or not being not branch qualified, basically, if those of you guys remember that old terminology. So I did 11 months in company command at Sand Hill, and then I was slated to go to the advanced course. The crazy part about it was I was doing change of command inventories on 9-11. So yeah. like the, the attacks were happening while I was doing company layouts. And at that same moment, I, I was I was really 
on the verge of being a five and fly guy. So I had an appointment with Cameron Brooks that weekend. It's like, I'll oh, change wow. man, go talk to Cameron Brooks and figure out what the future for Rob looks like. And then the two towers happened. And I was like, I called him up and I was like, Hey guys, like shit just got real. Cancel my appointment. And I never looked back after that point. That's amazing. What a story. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you decided to go to the career course before or after nine 11, because it was a very different decision. And I, and I feel like, you know, a lot of my classmates, we obviously went way before. I went way, way before. And, you know, it, hell, if I'd done company command, it would have been in Korea and I would have missed it regardless. Um, I, you know, I was a little surprised to learn how many of, of my classmates were involved in the Thunder Run just out of the, you know, it seemed like guys would be ahead of that curve, but that wasn't what happened. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, that's that's wild. I, I can't even imagine you as a five and fly guy, Rob. Honestly, it's like <laughs> hard for me to imagine. I mean, honestly, it's hard for me to imagine. So, yeah, I, I it was it was really one of those things that I was contemplating because it was like, man, I did all this work, I, I, you know, and yeah. that was part of the reason why. But that was part of the reason why I took the command early too. You know, like, hey, you command before the advanced course, so then I can make a decision without an adzo. Yeah, like, yeah, and yeah. That was. That was really what it was. I can make a decision without an ADZO, which is additional service obligation. But the other part of it was, is I got post of choice afterwards, right? Yeah. So I did my company command time, went to the advanced course, and like literally everybody in my advanced course was like Ranger Cats or 82nd dudes. And everybody was trying to get to strikers. Well, I got a by name request because I took the basic training company command. So you had all these guys that were squabbling trying to get in. And I was like, well, I know where I'm going as soon as this is over, straight to Fort Lewis. So went to Fort Lewis, uh, dude, like I, I have some crazy stories about my, my company command time too. So I literally assumed command two weeks before we deployed to Iraq. There was no change of command ceremony. It literally was the guy in front of me was dud. He got fired. Oh man. First part, yeah. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting like, and you got to remember like strikers were brand new in the yeah. early 2000s. So we were the dog and pony show. So I'm literally sitting there. I actually have a coin from the chief, the, from the secretary of uh, defense and the chairman of the joint chiefs. Cause they came out and I was doing a static display with my truck. And then the commanding general at Fort Lewis walks up to me and he goes, Rob, are you ready? I'm like, sir, what are you talking about? Oh, you haven't talked to, you haven't talked to Colonel rounds yet. Have you? I was like, no, sir. Like why? And then, the boss man walks up to me. He goes, Hey Rob, like, what are you doing this weekend? And I was like, well, I'm going to a jujitsu tournament. He's like, good. Enjoy it. Cause you take command on Tuesday. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. So I literally, I literally had a three day weekend and took command on Tuesday morning of uh, a rifle company that was about to deploy. So I literally went from being a staff dude for 18 months at the brigade staff into company command. I had no equipment to inspect because it was all on ships heading overseas. Right. So literally I had, I had, I had a shortage annex and a list of, you know, my who is that were going with me. You're missing all this stuff. Well, that's convenient because I never signed for all that stuff. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, uh, so then we went out on the first deployment and we, we got there, we were OIF 1.5. So we probably overlapped some time when Ray was there, but we were just in a different area. So we went to Samara first. And so that was the first, uh, now, like remember the gold dome moss that got blown up in like 2005, 2006, we were doing operations before all that stuff happened. But uh, yeah, so we were, we were stationed there. That was a first, that was a first deployment. Uh, did uh, 11 months on the in country commanded the whole time. So that was the coolest experience of my life was like being in charge of soldiers downrange yeah. with a yeah, 360 yeah. degree range fan. Like it was amazing, you know, like it was amazing. And, and, and like, that was, that's why I tell like, like for all the cadets or parents that are sending your kids to West Point, like the one thing that I'll tell you is like company command in a combat environment. If nobody gets hurt, that's like the single greatest thing that you can give a young, that's a, that's a greatest Christmas gift that you can give a young person in their life is just an organization of people that were trying to get stuff done. I mean, it was, it was, it literally was a blast. Like, ran all over the place with those, with those guys. That's but awesome, uh, dude. yeah, other part of it is, as I had, I had a total of five operational deployments. I did Iraq three times, Afghanistan twice. That's and, a good uh, number. It, it, it yeah. does seem amazing. Like I remember as a cadet that if you met a Colonel who'd been to Vietnam twice, like that was a lot. And if you'd met one to, that had been to Vietnam three times, like invariably the dude was, was yeah. 
I had like a different personality, you know what I'm saying? And, and for, for better and worse. And, uh, you know, nowadays our peers, they're like three as a start. And, and that's just wild to me. Like, I just, I yeah. can't even believe that. So yeah. go ahead. Well, and, and the thing of it is, is like, I've actually had classmates apologize to me because they effed off and took like staff jobs or went to school or whatever. And I'm on like my fourth deployment and they're on their second. You know, so I'm kind hey, of two, a, de two deployments is still a lot in my book. I mean, yeah, well, two, for, for our year group, 2.2.5 .2 deployments was the average. Right. So you had two long tours and a short tour or you did like, you know, the guys that got hosed after we did like we almost like I literally remember those that uh, we were ripping with uh, one two five that was coming in the striker brigade behind us. Yeah. 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 And they almost extended us for the surge to go to, back into uh Ramadi to hunt down, hunt down a guy, I forget his name now, but uh, Colonel comes out and he's like, look, unload all your magazines now. Like, why, sir? just do it. And we're like stripper clips flying everywhere. We're handing over all this ammo. And when they came back and they were like, Hey, you guys need to stay. We're like, we can't, we gave up all our ammo. We signed everything over. And like, that's the only thing, like that is the only thing that kept us from running around, you know, Baji and Taji and all the oh, other crazy man. places around Baghdad for another, you know, three to five months. Because what happened is people realized how flexible the strikers were because we could drive, you know, you could drive four or 500 miles with some jerry cans on a tank of gas. And so mm, we could get, that's amazing. Any, yeah, we could basically get anywhere in the country overnight. Yeah. And so because of that, then we became like the flex force, like, Hey, we need somebody down in, you know, next to the Iraq Kuwait border. Well, send a striker company. Yeah. You know, hey, we need somebody to go out towards Syria Send a striker company. And I like, mean, we we're driving all over the place. Not, not to put too fine a point on it, but that's literally what cavalry used to do back in the day. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, not, not so much like, like, like dragoons, I guess you would say, yeah. you know, mounted infantry. Yeah. Well, and that was, a, and that was the thing. That was the advantage that we had early because, you know, we were 125% manned as a brigade. So I had 172, yeah. I had 172 hulas in the company. So when we hit the ground and the ramp dropped, like if I put a platoon in your house, you had 50 Muldoons in your house, like searching through stuff. Right. And, and like these guys are hungry because it's their first deployment. Like the only saving grace that I had legitimately was my first art. I had two guys, well, three guys in my company, senior medic in the battalion was a uh, desert storm guy. Had a first sergeant that was a private or a sergeant, or first, yeah, sergeant first class McLean, who was a private during Desert Storm. And my first sergeant, who was that's amazing. Yeah, my first sergeant had done like this guy, crazy story. So he was did Panama as a specialist, he did oh, God. Somalia as a sergeant, and then he did Desert or I'm sorry, so, Somalia or Desert Storm, and then Somalia. And so he was my first art. He was awesome. Like the dude, you know, yeah. Tapped out. That. Yeah. Like, like he was the greatest dude in the world and he's awesome guy. And, uh, first art, first art and, uh, Swift was a, was an amazing human being. So we literally had, you know, 172 Muldoons, 20 trucks, like, Hey, go out and, and, you know, fight your nation's battles. So, which was, which was super cool. But uh, getting back to the outline, my favorite duty station, honestly, I would have liked Fort Lewis if we weren't in the field all the time. So in a, yeah. in a, in a 14 month span, we had NTC twice and JRTC. And so that was miserable. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot. Well, I was going to ask you, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to do this interview was you said you're coming close to the 20th anniversary of your combat mission, your first combat mission as a company commander. So uh, yeah. you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So that one. Like that's a dude, I will tell you that uh, you tend to get put in the right place at the right time, you know, and like the guy that I replaced was was a good human being. He was a terrible infantry officer. He would have got some he would have got somebody killed. Like literally the NCOs in the company sold them like all the NCOs walked into the battalion commander's office, just like in Band of Brothers before Band of Brothers even happened. And they, oh, sold, wow. and they sold the guy. They walked in there and were like, sir, we cannot deploy with this dude. He's going to get somebody killed. Wow. And so that's what precipitated me assuming command. But then, you know, we get there. We did a month of training out of Camp Doha, like literally driving in the desert, mounted formations. We're doing echelon right, echelon left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Diamonds, Vs, all that stuff, right? Driving through the desert, training up. And then uh, we get deployed. 
drive across the, you know, we drive across the border. We get to a small town, five pace setter. It's a fourth ID field artillery base. They had uh, the Paladins there and we were doing, you know, dismounted and mounted infantry operations. And we did some local stuff, which we didn't go very far at all. Just like some atmospheric patrols or whatever. The first raid that we were supposed to do, we went out and uh, get this call over radio. Somebody said, you know, Bravo three, two, I think it was three, two, three, one flipped. So like we were driving Oof. around, we hit an irrigation canal and it just yeah. gave way underneath the weight of the vehicle and uh, rolled over. I actually had, had four guys die that night, but one guy got resuscitated, which was amazing. So Sergeant Mata survived. So he's alive and kicking and still finished his career because he had some guys pounding on his chest until they basically passed out and oh my God. Uh, revived and revived him. But uh, Stephen Bridges, Specialist, Wish, Specialist Wesley and Specialist Beckman staff, like, all died as a result of this accident. I knew Sergeant Bridges before uh, before I took the company because he was a battalion ammo dude and I was a brigade ammo guy. And I worked with Steve for the first 18 months I was in the unit. And when he found out that I was coming to take over the company, he's like, we're going to be okay, guys. And when we got back, and I have never had anything, anyone say anything else to me in my military career that, that, was rewarding but also painful as absolutely steven bridges's dad walked up to me after we got back after that deployment looked me in the eye and he said you're captain robinson you are the only officer that steve ever liked it's and amazing that stuck with me that's gonna stick with me until the day i die and then you know specialist wesley was crazy because his family notified him that uh that his grandmother died and because it wasn't local parentis, which means he wasn't raised by his grandmother, we couldn't put him on emergency leave. And he, like, he was really down about it. He was really, you know, yeah. upset. And then he came to me and he was like, you know what, sir? Like, you know, if I can't go back, then I just want to be with my guys because like, I don't want you to pull me. I don't want you to not put me on mission. I'd rather be in the fight than worrying about things that I can't control at home. And so he was sure. driving yeah. the vehicle when it happened and specialist Blick and staff, he was kind of a knucklehead, but he just started like turning his life around. So like he has cleaned up his act and stopped drinking and he was like going to church and hanging out with people that were going to be a positive influence on him. And the dude, you know, like that was gone. And, uh, one of the most like still terrible situation for me. One of the most gut wrenching moments of my military career was having to go identify the bodies and then having my superstar stud, you know, mustard stain, multi-time combat veteran first art start crying. Like, dude, like, what the hell am I supposed to do? Like, if this guy's losing it, you know, it's like, like, I'm not like, I'm nobody special. And this guy's actually, you know, seen some like worse combat than anyone will ever see. And, uh, later on, one of my, uh, one of my NCOs came up to me and we're just sitting down chilling and he goes, Hey, sir, you know what? He's like, God needed guardian angels for us this deployment. So he took those three to protect the rest of us. It's and, awful. And when and somebody said, yeah, it's terrible, but it's also like, I don't know what to say. You know, I can't argue with that. I mean, it, it's it's not like there's something that you were going to do different, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. It, yeah. it was no. just, it, it was like one of the most powerless things situations i had ever had in, in my career however you know after that it literally was like hey we're not gonna lose anybody else and like that became the the company mantra and we we took the we took it to the enemy you know and and there's a yeah. big huge there's a big huge gunfight that happened on the 4th of august and we spent 18 hours in continuous contact with the bad guys and uh yeah we did a uh we did two large vehicle recoveries. So we had some hets that got stuck on the side of the road and I get a call from my battalion S3 going, Hey, y'all need to secure those trucks until we can recover them. And I'm like, oh, wow. you're, you're kidding me. Right. He's like, Nope, we don't want them to make it on Al Jazeera. Uh, like there's no dead Americans. Like, why are we staying out here? Yeah. And they're, they're trucks. Like, yeah. And, and they were like, Nope, secure them. Roger that. And it's like, Hey, sir, you're, you know who you're talking to. Right. And they're like, what do you mean? If you're turning me loose and you're leaving me out here for 18 hours, like we're putting the wood to that ass. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> 17 Toe Two Bravos later, we came back. Wow. 
Yeah. Wow. So like, like we shot 17 toes as a company in that engagement. I shot two basic loads as a company commander. So, you know, it's Jesus. Like, so like, for those of you that don't know, a basic load is what you're expected to go through in a, in a day. So going through two in 18 hours is, is pretty intense. Yeah. So we yeah. were, we're, yeah, we were a pretty running, running gun fight. And, uh, we actually had one guy, we had two guys get hurt in that engagement. Both of them made it back. Like we actually gave ground to get those guys into the hospital. Both of them lived. Both of them are married, have kids. Their kids are like now in ROTC and joining the army. Because, That's amazing. You know, their, their dads lived, you know? And so that was, that was, it, it was intense, man. And, and like I said, we, dude, like I have so many firsts from being in the first striker brigade. I had the first blogger in the army. So the number of times I got, yes, literally I, the number of times I got my ass chewed or, you know, some specialist typing something that some nerd in the NSA was like, oh, we intercepted this communication oh my and God. it said, you know, and it said, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, come on guys. And it literally turned into like, Hey, you either need to proofread all this stuff before he submits or he just needs to stop submitting. And I was like, look, I was like, I literally told him the kid wrote a book, which is crazy. Cause I told him, I was like, look, man, just stop posting yeah. your blog and just write yeah. it all down and then write a book. And a kid yeah. wrote a book as, as a bestseller. <laughs> That's so, a good idea. That was, that was a good piece of advice. You know, cause I like, because quite frankly, I just got tired of getting called to the carpet. Cause like literally every time he would write something, people would lose their mind and they're like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, he's, he said after 18 hours, you guys needed gas. And I looked at him and I'm like, well, what vehicle in the military, <laughs> doesn't need gas after 18 hours you know what i mean like it but that was the kind of stuff that they were like like just dragging me you gotta you gotta understand because i was in new york city right and it was not people were not doing it like it was not it was it was people like the military was a little bit too ready to let the populace forget that people were over there yeah. And it was like, if we can avoid negative press, then we can just do what we got to do and get out of there, which I'm sure I, oh, it's yeah. not like I don't understand that impulse, but it was dumb because it disconnected the American people from what was going on in their name for 20 freaking years. Yeah. Well, dude, man, I, I can tell you, like, I have a video game that was done from one of my missions when I was a company commander. And the crazy part of it is, is they built the game. <laughs> nice. They built the game. <laughs> Oh, I, like that's not stealing my thunder. That's awesome. <laughs> so, you know, we'll drop it on the screen and then we'll cover it after we get done. But uh, yeah, so I had a video game after an engagement that we had May the 24th, took back to Sheikh Fatih Mosque. And like there's a there was a subscription service in the early 2000s that was building out basically combat operations as they were happening. They'd get the unclassified report. And that's make a, wild. And that's make a amazing. Mission, and make a mission on the video game. And so like I'm literally doing media reports. So we... The whole story and, and long story short was we did something that the Marines didn't do. Like we used restraint. So like the week before the Marines like dropped a 500 pounder in the middle of a mosque, we did not do that. And because we didn't do that, it was like hero of the day. So they're like, Hey, we need to talk to you guys. So I ended up doing like seven hours of interviews with the commanding general of the mission in Iraq because they were so excited, like, oh my gosh, you guys didn't break stuff. And it's like, make no yeah, mistake, yeah, yeah. we wanted to, but we didn't. <laughs> so it's always interesting. But uh, yeah. But All right. So um, are we uh, are we ready to turn the page and and uh, and move on, or or do you yeah. like? I, I don't want to. I don't want to rush you through this because I I know that you've got a lot of notes here. Um, but yeah. we've also we got Heisman finals coming in, and and yeah. you know like, I want to talk about. Cool. Okay, so so before we before we start talking Heisman finalists, you're you're now at the former Fort Bragg, no Fort Liberty, and I do want to talk about like what you're doing there, like what you're doing with your life outside of Astro football, and uh, and and talk a little bit about like sort of how you how you got here. So, um, you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, for sure. So, retired outside of Fort Bragg, as you mentioned, uh, my wife landed a government contracting job, so she did all your, all your plans, trains, and automobiles at Fort Bragg for like two years. And so she did a lot of unit movements and that kind of stuff. And then she kind of moved up into a uh, GS gig and she's working at Campbell university now. So that's kind of why we stayed. And then I work 
I've basically been a small business accelerator for the last three years. Since I retired, yeah. all I've been doing is trying to help small businesses get their technology into the yeah. Department of Defense. In including this one. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it helps. You know, so right now I work for a small startup called Wingspan. They have won a whole bunch of government grants uh, working on government contracts, and we're trying to build out our DOD portfolio next year. But cool part of it is it's a backpack drone. It takes you about two minutes to set it up, and then you can throw it like a paper airplane. It flies for two hours. And so that is amazing. That's our that, that is amazing. Yeah. yeah. And so when you think about some of the other capabilities that the army has, like price point wise, we're cheaper and we have better endurance, but that's not to throw shade on other stuff, but that's just where I'm well, I mean, right it's, now. this is, this is where, this is the future. I mean, we've all seen this. I mean, this yeah. is very obviously where we're going for better or worse. So, yeah. Um, all right. So we, we brought you on here because I, I got to be honest with you. The biggest reason we wanted you on is because you used to work at KDT. Um, if yeah. you want to get on Azure Football, your best way to do that is through KDT. Um, so where'd your interest in radio come from? Yeah. So honestly, I'm old. I'm an old school sports center guy. Right. So I used to grow up before, like all the screaming and yelling happened. Like it literally was <laughs> two dudes on a table doing sports highlights. Right. I think Chris Chris Berman and Stuart Scott are probably two of the all-time best guys that I've ever seen do sports commentary. And I always wanted to do that. You know, so like watching those guys in high school and you know, early Potter College, and then having the opportunity to uh to work at the radio station. And I did primarily sports, you know, like yeah, I did yeah. A, you know, I did a show, a music show like the last two years, but like majority of my time there was doing army sports so i was an engineer and of course i worked my way up you know like everybody should yeah, I yeah. Was the en did engineering for basketball hockey and baseball as a plea like like it worked out that i tore my acl as a plea because like i didn't have anything to do but be on crutches i wasn't doing drill <laughs> so i actually got to go hang out at the station and do a lot yeah. of the behind the scenes networking stuff that yeah got the shows on the air so after that i uh moved to be like just a researcher for the basketball team. And so we, I would do research for the guys that were calling the games live. And then Cal year and first a year, like we were the traveling road show. Like we covered all the Patriot league basketball games. We did all the army football games that were home. And uh, we actually, the one trip section that was super, super cool was we actually did get to go call army Notre Dame at the metal. That Man. is cool. That and is so, cool. Like we were up in the press box with everyone else. That's one of the coolest photos. I got it somewhere uh, of me sitting in the press booth, looking down on the Meadowlands with other two broadcast guys, Russ Ames and Paul Holonek, that were uh, on the, the team with me. But yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. It's all about, you know, just being able to, to bring some sanity to sports because one of the biggest, because we can, everybody can be a pundit, right? It's easy just to be a talking head that just, you know, pulls crap out of your butt just yeah. to just to create clickbait. You know what I mean? Like I can create all the clickbait I want to get all the hits and get people to look at my show or whatever. But if you can't have an intelligent conversation about what's going on, like Walt dropping in like, oh, I don't want to steal Rob's thunder, but the Heisman finalists are out. You're not stealing my thunder because I absolutely want to know who's the Heisman finalist. Right. And that's just because that's who we are as a team. And I think that's part of the culture that's here at As for Football is yes do we get upset yes like if you look yeah. at our text thread we vent with each other before we do the <laughs> show right we we exercise the demon so it's not coming across on the team and like one of the things i saw today that really was frustrating was to get clicks one of the navy social media guys puts out a list of all the uh the guys that you know got turned back or or yeah red, i saw that red shirt and that. you see that and you're like dude you know what have a little class, but I perfectly, absolutely expect that from an effing Navy guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it, it does not surprise me in the slightest. Like, we don't dunk on the players if we don't have to, and that's just an unnecessary shot for no reason. Well, it, the thing I don't understand about it is you are required to do a sport. It's not like a reward. It's a, it's a requirement. Every semester you have yeah. to play a sport. So yeah. going out for a sport is not a reward. It's not a punishment. It's a graduation requirement. So yeah, if these guys are around for whatever reason, you know, bad knees, couldn't take the IOCT or whatever, why would yeah. they not play? They have to play something. Like, yeah. it's required. So yeah, it's, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't understand that argument at all. Not even a little. Yeah. 
Yeah, my my only my only thing that I the only problem that I had with the athletic program at West Point was they would not let me play in the goat engineer game. It's not cool. Because I would have made one hell of a goat, man. Because like they're like, nope, you got you know, so the the yeah. rule is like if you major eight at all in football, whether it be on fifties or sprint or okay. on the big boy team, you cannot play in the goat engineer game because like you know what you're doing, you might hurt someone. Like it's football, man. It's contact sport. Like, why can't we do that? And it's not like we're gonna like run through people. Like, yeah, there might be the one star and wreath asshole that we take a shot at, but you know, for the most part, it's just a game. But All right. that was my only beef. All right, last question. It's beat Navy season. What's your favorite memory from the Army Navy game? All right, so favorite memory. I'll touch on this one. Well, as a cadet, very very hard because I got to see the drive live when we went ninety nine yeah. yards and beat Navy, and then actually winning the CIC trophy as a class for the fourth time in a row in 97. I mean, that's kind of like a, those are yeah. kind of, it's like a push on those. Plus like in the 96 game, we actually had the president was there. They gave him the CIC trophy. Like Bill Clinton came down to the field and handed the trophy. Oh, that's cool. Which what was kind of, which was yeah. kind of cool. You know what I mean? So like yeah, yeah. those are kind of on par with each other, but as a grad hands down was convincing the G3 at CJTF OIR to let us turn on the army Navy game on the jock floor while we're fighting against ISIS. Everybody has their headphones on and we're watching the game. So if something came across the radio, we could still respond, but we were able to watch the game and watch army beat Navy in the streak. And I had captains in my section that had been around army. Yeah. You know, I've never seen that their entire never, career. Yeah. Never seen yep. it. So they had been like, I literally had a captain that was running around with like a poncho, like a cape. <laughs> around the jock floor because they just they couldn't believe that it happened you know and it was like hey have a little faith they're wearing 80 second jerseys they're gonna win you know and that was that was like amazing time yeah i people don't understand that it was it was an entire career for for like you know dudes who were my class and your class too i mean you know maybe a few a few good years in the early years but it was it was like all, your whole career yeah, you know to the dude, point where you're you know you're like senior majors or whatever and you having to listen to your opposite number you know talk about oh i got off the submarine and blah 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 and just shut up jesus yeah, like dude dude we had classmates up until 2016 that had kids that had never seen army beat navy their kids never saw army beat navy yeah and that's, you're like that's, dang man that's it's just <laughs> all right Insane. all right so let's talk about heisman finalists and then uh you know what let's do this commercial and then let's talk heisman finalists Right. So, um, if you are listening to us still, uh, Craig Oxane is the pre uh, president is the sponsor of this show. He is a member of the West Point class of 1994. He's licensed to lend in all 50 states, but based out of Chicago, one of the largest VA lenders in the country. Craig is going to give you super competitive rates. He's going to give you the best deal he possibly can. And this matters because the mortgage process is super confusing. Interest rates move all over the place. You want to be able to deal with somebody that you can trust. When you have questions and you're going to have questions because there is like a lot of paperwork that goes along with buying a house if you call craig craig himself is going to answer the phone and answer your question which is freaking amazing and this is how the west point network actually functions right craig is helping us stay in business here at as for football and we're helping you get the best deal on a mortgage that we possibly can by introducing you to the very man you need to beat you need to meet Ugh. craig does not charge lending fees for veterans it's a huge savings like 1300 bucks guys Get that money, $1,300. Craig Oxane, Vice President of Residential Lending. His link is on our website. Just click the little button on askforfootball.com. Take you to his website. You'll fill out a little questionnaire. You'll be talking to the guy by the end of like the day. So anyway, Rob, man, we've been talking about it, dancing around it. Who are our Heisman finalists? All right, Heisman finalists, I'm going to throw this back up on the screen. So right now you've got Jalen Daniels, Bo Nix, Michael Penix Jr., and Marvin Harrison Jr., who is winning? Sport. I already said it, and I've said it again, and I'll say it one more time. The Pac-12 champion quarterback, Michael Penix Jr., is going to win the Heisman Trophy. The only reason why I say that is because all the other guys have losses on their records. Even though Jaden uh, Daniels has put up tremendous numbers, it's the MVP for the winningest team in college football. Uh, all right, that's fair. Um, I personally want Daniels to be the quarterback of the New York Giants. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that is what I want. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. I, I think Marvin Harrison Jr., if he wins, he might opt out. But, like, Bo Nix 
is tremendous, but it's hard for it's hard for me, like as a as a guy who watched a lot of football and watched both of those games, to give the guy the nod when you lost the Penix head up twice. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I agree with that. I, yeah, like, I had no argument there. I, um, I, but yeah. I think I think you know the, part of the problem with the Heisman Trophy is just like it with the college football committee. It's no longer it's no longer about you know who's the best player in college football. It's storylines. You know. It would be awesome if Jaden Daniels win it. The guy produces, he's got the numbers, absolutely. But yeah. his win loss record, like he didn't even sniff the SEC the, championship. The thing is, without him, they're like not even are they even five hundred in the SEC West this year? Oh, not even no, not even like, close. Not even yeah. So I mean Yeah, that guy's a magician for sure. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. All right, let's wrap it up, man. All right. Hey, look. We only got one game this week, and you all know who we're picking. And if you're not picking them, like you don't need to be listening to this show anymore, at least until next season. <laughs> but uh, we've got uh, Army Navy this week. Uh, we're going to do a much, much deeper job with covering that. You know the army, the army game. And if you haven't read the article that James put out today, man, like yeah. you were missing out because that is one of the best articles that has been written in my short time here at As for Football that uh previews the army navy game yeah so he uh it. he called me on my way we spent an hour talking about how we were going to do that um he called me on the way to the coastal carolina game and we we talked about the thanksgiving podcast like we lit out the thanksgiving podcast if if army won that game and yeah. then talked about that article for and I, that took me from bridgeport connecticut to about halfway up the uh palisades parkway so that's how long we were on the on the call yeah I will tell you, like, like the, I think, I think this is going to be a, a good game. Like, honestly, uh, I would, I would like to see Army steamroll them, just because I, I think, <laughs> and and the reason why I say that is because to have a disappointing season, to pull it out with a with a solid win, you know, like I'm not saying like 30 points. I'm just saying like 10, 15, two touchdowns. You know, I want to beat Navy by two two touchdowns. The reason why I say that is because I think that will tee up the next season very yeah. very well. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And then I saw I saw some crazy article, and again I didn't read the whole thing, but the headline was like, "Hey, look, if Army and Navy run the table in their respective divisions in the in the AAC, they could play twice in the same year." And it was like, "Oh, great, here we go." Can you you know? imagine that'd be amazing. Like that, like back two weeks in a row playing Army Navy, that would be that'd insane. be amazing. That'd, that'd be, be amazing. insanity. Like what? But you got to think about it. The 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 one game would be neutral field. And then the other one would be at one of the home stadiums. Like that's madness. <laughs> and and the which one would be more important? Because you'd have the conference championship and followed by the star game the the next week. Yeah. Like which would you <laughs> rather have? I personally would I would rather have the commander in chief trophy. So I would rather have the non conference win. But I don't think that's <laughs> I don't I don't foresee that happening in the in the <laughs> uh, I don't foresee that happening in the next, I, in the I next don't, few years. Yeah. Uh, I think Army's going to be good. I don't know if I listen. I don't know how long it's going to take them to fully implement the new offense and what changes we're going to see after you know, kind of the way that this the offense would probably evolve a little bit over the off season. But I think they're close. Yeah. But so um, that's yeah. You know, I, I think I, they're close. I, yeah, I legitimately think the uh, the new blocking scheme that they yeah. picked up from yeah. the gun option is going to help the flex bone. And like I said, Absolutely. like my, my, my ideal scenario is from 20 to 20, you know, like from our goal line to the 20 yard line or 25 yard line flex bone, get in the open field, run the gun option, and then go back to the flex bone as your goal line set. Like that's a perfect world for me. I just, I just want to be able to, to run plays that make sense. Like in the pros, I realized that, that the going from, the NFL to service academy football, you're you're skipping like multiple levels of football. But you know, you want to be able to run the plays that make sense and not be stuck yeah. in something that doesn't make sense. That's what drives me bananas about it. Yeah. But we will dive yeah. deeper into this. Hey, so Much bandwagon fa- yeah, bandwagon fantasy sports, really quick update. I'm gonna call it now. I think Matt's gonna win it because like I'm out of exchanges, <laughs> so I'm just riding it until the end. So I'm just hanging on for dear life to see what happens. But uh really Really have enjoyed doing that for the Army football or shoot, ask for football, college football roundtable. I'm your host, Rob. 
calling out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. We got Dano Ikebesa calling out of Coastal Connecticut. Trigger Joe is in parts unknown. Maybe he's hanging out with the Road Warriors or he's doing homework. But either way, I really, really appreciate uh, you guys indulging me for a moment and uh, let me talk some stories. But uh, as awesome. always, they're always much better over beer. But mm. uh, we can uh, always true. enjoy that. But uh, hey, we've got Navy this week. So as they as they say, it may be time for all men to raise the black flag and slit some throats. But if that's not your persuasion, beat Navy. Beat them. Thanks for listening to the Ask for Football College Football Roundtable. Join the AFF team next week for hot takes and college football analysis. If you like the show and you want to support us, consider signing up for our Patreon at Ask for Football or opting into our mailing list at askforfootball.com forward slash subscribe. We'll catch you guys next week. And as always, beat Navy.